I will share my screen here actually. Thank you to everybody who's logging on. We'll just give you a, a few more minutes for some more attendees to filter in and then we'll get started. Thanks for being here. Alrighty, I've got a, a couple minutes past 1 p.m. Eastern here, so in the interest of everybody's time, we'll get started. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us here today. Uh, my name is Ethan Churchill. I'm the project manager for CGC and RCCV. I'll be serving as your moderator for today's webinar, this one focused on Pinot Gris virus and cirrhotic Lyme. Uh, we're joined by two highly renowned guest speakers today. We have Dr. Siddhasana Pujari and Dr. Maher Al Rani with us here. Uh, doing our presentations. Uh, just a few couple quick administrative notes before we get started. Uh, I'd like to mention to you all that this webinar is being recorded as all of our webinars are. So if you would wish to view it again afterwards or share the video link with colleagues who weren't able to make it today, the webinar recording uh, should be available by early next week and I'll be sending that out in, uh, in follow-up emails to everybody, posting it on our socials as well. Uh, for questions, if any of you have questions at any point during these presentations, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen that you can use to type those questions in. And after both of our presentations, we'll have a, a Q&A period there where we can uh, address those all at the same time. Uh, for some of you as well, when presentations are being shared, if you'd like to adjust the size of your screen, there should be a little double bar on the right side of the presentation window between our camera feeds and the presentation. And you can use that to adjust the size of the screen if you'd like to uh, make the presentations a little bigger or smaller. Uh, so before we get into the presentations, I'm just going to do 
a, a pretty brief overview of one of CGCN's programs, uh, our interim verification program for virus testing. It is uh, quite relevant to our presentation today, since one of the four viruses of concern that we're looking for in this program is Pinot Gris virus. Uh, so our interim verification program here is meant to serve as more of a temporary measure uh, until there is sufficient supply of certified material available through our long-term program. Uh, the, the main focus of this program here is testing existing propagation blocks uh, for nurseries or wineries for the four viruses that you see listed here, leaf roll one and three, as well as red blotch and Pinot Gris virus. Uh, obviously, you know, the that being the focus of our webinar today, this was an important thing for us to bring up. Uh, and conveniently as well, SUD leads the team at Covey that is responsible for all of our virus testing. So uh, it's nice to have him here in person to thank him for being so heavily involved in that. In terms of how this program works and the protocols, there's a bit of a, a visual chart here for you that I'll walk through just briefly. Uh, the first phase of testing for the interim verification program is a random sample of 10% of the, uh, the vineyard, which includes visual inspection and PCR testing. Uh, if 15% or more of the vineyard is found to be infected, it's dropped from the program, which you can see in the red there. Uh, if it's under the 15% threshold, a propagation block will be moved into the second phase of testing. That phase consists of testing each individual vine via a composite sample of uh, leaves from five vines or canes from two vines. Uh, and the threshold for virus for this phase of the testing is 0.1%, which would be one in 1,000 vines. If the composite sample is above that threshold, the nursery has the option to either test all of those vines individually and remove only the infected ones or to remove all the vines in that composite sample. Uh, and once the vineyard or nursery block is tested and confirmed to be under that 0.1% infection threshold, uh, the plants that are propagated from those vines can be deemed verified by CGC and RCCV. Um, obviously, like any certification program, there, there can be no full warranty given on a final plant, but it's a, it's a nice bit of reassurance and, and verification as the, uh, the name of the program would suggest. Uh, we do also conduct yearly audits, 10% random sampling, um, as well as visual inspections of the vineyards and nursery records to ensure that there has been no reinfection of the propagation block, just to uh, try to provide as much clean material to nurseries into the industry as we can while we wait for material to bulk up from the long-term program. So that's just a very quick rundown of how the verification program works. Um, obviously, Sud uh, and Maher both will be talking a bit more about uh, Pinot Gris virus specifically uh, and how that relates to this program. But if anybody has any questions about uh, CGCN's programming in terms of virus testing and our protocols, I'm happy to, uh, to answer questions or you can find more information listed on our website there. So that's all that I have for you right now. Um, I will allow Sud to start getting his presentation ready and I will uh, read his biography for you all here. So Dr. Sudesh Sana Pujari is a senior scientist at the Cool Climate Enology and Viticulture Institute or CUBI located at Brock University in St. Catharines, Ontario. He received his PhD in plant pathology from Washington State University. Before joining Covey, he completed his NSERC postdoctoral fellowship at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, Summerland, BC. Currently at Covey, Dr. Pujari leads multiple research projects focused on grapevine virus epidemiology, advanced molecular diagnostics, and disease management aspects. So I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Sorry, so you're just on mute. Okay, I think you're good now. Hey, can you see my screen on a full, full screen mode? Yes, that looks good, thanks. All right, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, <clears throat> as uh, Ethan mentioned, we'll be talking about um, uh, Grape Point Pinot Gris virus. Um, um, just an outline of uh, my presentation today, um, just to know about, uh, you know, the timeline of Pinot Gris virus, when it is first uh, discovered and uh, how it is distributed, uh, what type of symptoms it, 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 it can produce on uh, different wine grape cultivars, and uh, how uh, about the epidemiology of this uh, uh, Pinot Gris virus, what we know so far, 
and how to detect this virus and you know, uh, in summary what is the status in Canada for example so first two things about the timelines and the symptoms um, typically um, in grape point virology um, what we see uh, here um, is around every around 10 15 or 20 years we'll, we'll be seeing a new virus that is emerging um, that probably distributed uh, around the world um, just like um, GPGV, the grapevine pinogree virus from here on, I'll be uh, calling it as just as a GPGV. Um, say, um, for example, if you take a, a grapevine red blotch virus, uh, which, is, um, which, which is what we know around uh, 2012 or 2010, um, around that time, actually, um, uh, we also came to know that there is another virus called grapevine pinogree virus, GPGV, is also started to um, started to, uh, we, we started to find it uh, initially from European countries and then uh, eventually during 1915 or 16 to the North American countries as well as Australia. So as you can see in this map, um, the countries that are that have been reported, the presence of GPGV has been highlighted in red. Um, as you can see, most of the European countries uh, as well as uh, a few North American countries, including uh, US and Canada. Um, uh, but one thing that I wanted to say that the countries uh, uh, we have highlighted here, not that the entire country, the virus is present, it's only in the wine grape, wine grape growing uh, regions, uh, particularly in some areas in those countries. Um, that being said, um, so uh, just uh, a, a few points about what we know so far about this virus. Uh, as I just mentioned, uh, it was first observed some um, typical symptoms of mottling um, as the virus is associated with uh, grapevine uh, leaf mottling and deformation disease. Uh, typically, the grapevines that are showing uh, leaf deformations or mottling symptoms uh, was first observed in, in the country uh, Slovenia in 2021 and followed by Italy in 20, uh, 20, 2003, uh, 2001 and 2003. So, um, so once uh, this type of um, symptoms were observed and uh, you know they were both on uh, red fruited as well as white fruited cultivars as well as you know I've been observing in, in the table grapes as well uh, as well as some some of the wild grape uh, 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 cultivars um, so this um, mottling symptoms typically observed early in the growing season um, and then there are reports of uh, you know these symptoms of mottling uh, can be recovered um, during the growing season, uh, but not in all cultivars. There are some reports that can that has shown that uh, some of these cult wine grape cultivars they show symptoms early in the season and then started to recover uh, during the growing season. So typical symptoms. I do have a couple of slides that will show how these symptoms looks like on on the leaves or on the on the wine itself. Um, Typical sim symptoms include um, delayed bud break, um, shortened internodes, um, chlorotic or uh, mosaic leaves, um, stunting of the shoots. Uh, and because of this stunting of the shoots, uh, usually we don't see uh, much of a yield in, in terms of uh, uh, number of clusters or berry weight. Um, so severe economic losses were reported, uh, but by just looking at these symptoms, uh, one, one can expect that uh, there won't be much um, the quality of the grapes or the quantity of grapes that would be present if there is a symptomatic um, why, uh, strain of the virus. And also one of the things that we commonly observe when we look into the literature, a lot of reports that are saying that uh, they have been detecting this GPGV, but apparently with no uh, typical symptoms, what we call asymptomatic uh, strain of this virus. So looking at the symptoms, uh, as you can see here, um, this is on a Pinot Noir. Um, as I mentioned, there are shortened internodes, the leaves are uh, crinkled, or you can see the mottling patterns on the leaves um, and, and reduced growth uh, visually. visually. Um, another slide of the leaves that are again, um, um, the shape is irregular, uh, shortened internodes um, might be confused with uh, some kind of weedicide spray or a herbicide spray, uh, typically what we see, but the pattern of this virus symptoms probably might be different what, uh, 
uh, can be seen uh, with the herbicidal damage, for example. So um, based on this information, we do know that um, there are two types of strains of GPGV. One is the symptomatic strain, and another one is the asymptomatic strain. So what could influence um, this type of uh, phenomena? I mean, we have seen that uh, viruses can behave differently than exhibit different symptoms. For example, of COVID-19 on different individuals have different uh, host responses. But in plants uh, uh, and in uh, grapevine viticultural environment, what could influence uh, uh, something like this could happen to a virus? So. Uh, Talking about that, especially the host plant tolerance or resistance comes into first place. Um, I say this because uh, um, when you look into the literature, there are so many viruses that uh, these grape points are susceptible to. Um, typically, there are more than 80 different species of viruses that can infect grape points. But what we are interested in, they're, they're all not that important in terms of uh, how they can cause economic losses. Um, whether it is, it is um, the, the wine growth uh, physiology, or it would be affecting the fruit quality um, or wine quality ultimately. Uh, because so many viruses, they can either stay latent or doesn't show any symptoms. Um, for example, a um, lot of VT viruses or grapevine rupus distemperating associated virus, or a lot of viroids called uh, um, examples would be a hop stunt viroid. They don't show typically symptoms, although they are uh, some of these viruses are ubiquitous or very commonly uh, present, and especially in the white spinifera cultivars, um, because uh, we believe that um, there is a, a plant resistance uh, either in, in terms of uh, RNA uh, uh, silencing pathway, um, uh, what we call the plant uh, RNA silencing pathway, that would actually. Uh, tolerate or show resistance to these virus infections uh, to prevent them not to show any typical symptoms. Uh, and also the second thing is the sensitivity. Uh, we do know that some of these cultivars are sensitive to some type of viruses, some species of viruses or some strain of viruses. Um, and then uh, other factors that include uh, environmental factors like temperature, humidity, plays a big role in uh, uh, any uh, virus infection either exhibiting symptoms or staying as a latent uh, in a given host. And also, um, as I mentioned, virus strain is also important, whether how severe it would be in terms of its uh, replication strategy or how it will behave um, in, in a mixed infection scenario, for example. And also the titer of the virus. There are some studies that actually showed, in, especially in case of GPGV, that when they look into the titer or concentration of the virus, they have shown that the less concentration uh, in, in, in wines that are infected with the GPG, we are not showing symptoms, but some of the wines that are showing high titers uh, of the virus are showing symptoms. So that could also be an influencing factor. And then mixed infections is always the, the scenario in grapevine viruses, uh, especially in, in a commercial vineyard. Uh, uh, it's, uh, sometimes it's very hard to find why if it is a virus infected wines, it's very hard to find a wine that is infected with only single uh, virus, uh, virus. but um, you know, it, it's not only with the viruses, maybe some other uh, pathogens uh, are also be co-infected, whether that would influence the, um, the GBGV um, symptomatic uh, strain. Um, and also insect vector populations. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit about the vectors in a few slides and what could be the vector for uh, GPGV, but that is also one of the factor uh, because the, the, if the more number of insect vector population is present, that means it would increase the, the virus population in a, in a given vineyard. So um, going further, um, there are some reports, as, as I mentioned, the report is that um, especially uh, Batch John et al. in 2015, that uh, they have um, uh, observed some of these as asymptomatic wines um, in the commercial vineyards becoming symptomatic during the span of seven years. So um, we, we actually um, don't know what 
this the molecular mechanism what is the um, mechanism behind this uh, phenomena but uh, those are the visual observations they have they have made um, that is that's that's why uh, i would say that uh, when you are uh, trying to monitor for this particular virus uh, um, it is very important to see uh, uh, have a visual assessment as well as testing and that would play a key role in uh, in management of this disease um, and then um, seasonal variation is another um, factor that is uh, very common for majority of grapevine virus infections not only for gpgv for other viruses like leaf roll and red blotch um, this is also uh, has been observed uh, for gpgv uh, one season they show uh, very high severe symptoms another season not so much uh, again um, this would be depend on uh, so many other factors in a, in a commercial vineyard settings, like especially the temperature and humidity. Um, and as I mentioned before, the mixed infections are very common in grapevine viruses, and especially for GBGV. Uh, I'm not going to going through the list of the viruses, and uh, I do acknowledge the font is small there, so don't bother going into that. I just wanted to mention that um, uh, GBGV is uh, found uh, commonly. Um, in mixed infections with uh, viruses like rubus disease virus or other viruses like leaf roll viruses or um, VT viruses like uh, grapevine virus A and B or including the Sira virus, uh, uh, which would be the next topic that Dr. Mahar will be talking about. And uh, going to, um, uh, to the next topic is uh, how, uh, what, what we know about the spread. Uh, for majority of the grapevine viruses, we do know that uh, the primary spread of these viruses is through um, through the propagating material, and uh, uh, it's not so different for Canada because um, more than ninety percent of our wines are grafted. So it is very important to know that uh, um, whether whether it is a rootstock or a sand material that is infected uh, with uh, grapevine Pinot Gris virus, the mother. The, the daughter wine would be uh, infected when you graft them because the virus can move either way from rootstock to cyan or cyan to rootstock. Or if you are doing uh, own rooted uh, propagation, uh, if the mother wine in, is infected, it is obvious that the, the daughter wines would be um, contaminated with this material. So um, primary spread is through the uh, through the gra grafting or propagate, propagating material. And when it comes to the secondary spread, um, especially the viruses like uh, um, GPGV, uh, which belongs to the genus uh, Trichovirus in the family Beta Flexibilidae, and uh, what we know about viruses in, the, in that genus is there is another virus called grapevine berry inner necrosis virus, which is uh, not present so far in the states or in or, or in Canada. And uh, I believe that virus is quarantine pest in, in, in the States. Um, what we know about the secondary spread of these two viruses, which are closely related in terms of this genetic identity, is uh, these viruses are reported to be transmitted by the mites, uh, which is uh, Erinia mite, uh, Columerus uh, whitis, uh, which is a bit of scary for us because uh, we have a lot of it. Um, and um, some of these experiments were done done in controlled conditions, and, and one more study on, is also on a, a commercial settings. But um, there are more studies to be um, study, uh, studied on this aspect because uh, uh, we doesn't know what type of factors that will influence um, or to um, or to what are the, what are the factors that influence the increase in the efficiency of this transmission. Uh, if the uh, erinium mite is the uh, potential insect vector. Um, and then mechanical transmission uh, by either pruning or vineyard equipment is highly doubtful. Um, why I say that uh, if that is the case in some of the um, uh, observations that we made, uh, especially uh, the presence of asymptomatic strain in uh, a few vineyards here, here in Ontario, if uh, mechanical transmission is the, is a possibility, then probably would have find uh, a, a virus GPGV instance a lot more than what we have. Then uh, looking at more into the epidemiology of uh, grapevine uh, Pinot Gris virus, um, uh, there are studies that have been reported that some of these um, salacious crops, especially uh, very common 
uh, weed species that we have here in North America, like uh, lamb spot or, or Kinopodium album or white cam campion are uh, reported as an alternative host. That means the virus uh, uh, can, be uh, can be present on this virus, uh, on this uh, plant species, excuse me. Um, and then we, we still need more studies to see if this alternative hosts that have been reported uh, could act as a reservoir. That means uh, they could the virus could stay uh, in that in those uh, plant species and then uh, act as a potential uh, reservoir host for the in, insect species to come back onto the grapevines, for example. So we still have to do more studies on that to see if that is the possibility. So um, when it comes to detection of GPGV, um, again, um, GPGV is a, is a RNA virus, but uh, before going to the how, how we can detect the virus, but uh, I just wanted to tell you um, what, what is the preferred sampling time on tissue type or methods that you can do um, for, for sampling the leaf sample or cane samples for, for detecting this particular virus. Um, as you can see here in this uh, uh, graphic here, as I mentioned, the, the, the names of the months, uh, which is colored by green and the gray. Uh, the gray colors, especially in February, March, and April, and June and July, is just because uh, we don't have much of the plant material, um, because especially this is the case for Canadian um, uh, viticultural practices, uh, I would say, uh, that might be completely different for uh, California or uh, other countries. Um, uh, the cane samples, because in, we, we probably prune them all in February to April and um, June, July, uh, we do have a plant material. We can still go for, uh, especially the virus like Pinocchio virus. Um, but uh, because of the fact that uh, it's been reported that the virus concentration probably higher during the early season, like early spring, uh, which is right this time of the year, um, the Pinogui virus can be detected in higher uh, titers. But what we observed during our um, testing uh, practices, uh, either by PCR or, uh, or high throughput sequencing, that uh, um, we, did, we do detect the uh, virus throughout the growing season as well as in the dormant season and, uh, through either leaf samples, especially the mature leaf samples, uh, taking petioles as a, as a source of the uh, tissue, uh, or in the dormant season, uh, the uh, bark scrapings of uh, uh, the phloem, phloem tissue, um, especially from the lignified cane samples. So um, there is a high chance that uh, we can find this virus, we can detect this virus in, this, in those conditions as well. So as I mentioned, uh, this is um, uh, uh, RNA um, as a genome for the, sorry, um, GPGV has a single standard RNA as a genome. That means we have to go for uh, uh, reverse transcription PCR-based testing. Um, and the genome typically consists of three um, open reading frames. And it is very close to the, uh, another virus called the grapevine berry inner necrosis virus. So uh, there are primers that are um, specifically designed to detect through the transcription PCR that are targeting both uh, movement protein, uh, which is uh, short form for MP, uh, or code protein, which is short form for uh, CP. Um, so this is the table. Again, I'm not going to the details. And just to um, uh, mention that um, the RT-PCR uh, techniques are uh, qualitative PCR, RT-PCR techniques that have been developed, published, uh, even I see that uh, there is one study from uh, Dr. Meher group um, just, just recently published, uh, which uses the movement, movement protein, core protein and uh, genome as, as, a, as a target for uh, detecting this uh, particular uh, virus. Um, again, um, as I mentioned, the detection is successful using different tissue types, leaves, petioles, or um, you know, vascular tissue or from the lignified canes, or even the green, green shoots. Um, using both RT-PCR as well as quantitative PCR. And there have been a lot of studies uh, have, that have used either uh, what we call the deep sequencing or next generation sequencing or high, high throughput sequencing, which is very um, sensitive and comprehensive uh, for virus detection. Um, so going further, just to uh, mention, that, um, since we have differences in terms of uh, uh, how the virus behaves, 
especially there is uh, asymptomatic and symptomatic strains, um, people have um, started to study like um, to know whether is there any genetic uh, relation, especially in terms of uh, genome sequence of grape wine Pinot Gris virus uh, to its um, uh, phenological observations like the symptoms, asymptoms, uh, asymptomatic. So there have been several attempts to analyze um, the, the phylogenetic studies of uh, Pinot Gris virus um, and then correlating that with uh, the symptoms of origin. So notably, I have uh, listed here, there are five different uh, uh, reports. Uh, uh, I'm going to go through four of them. Uh, I'll probably leave the last one to the next speaker because he's right here. Uh, so let's, um, as you can see, they are chronologically uh, order, uh, uh, listed um, because uh, the way that they have been studied this virus. So uh, go, going to the first one, uh, Sardili et al. and 2015, um, what they have done is they have taken uh, a, a partial sequence um, that is a combination of both movement protein and uh, uh, core, pro core protein, uh, overlapping region. And they did a phylogenetic analysis comparing to see if they can differentiate uh, whether these virus isolates form into different groups based on what the symptoms they have observed in the field. So when they did that, they did observe a, uh, two different clades as uh, differentiated by the gray shaded area and the white shaded area here. Um, so they did find a very perfect uh, combination of, okay, one group of isolates are belonging to the um, isolates that are showing symptoms and another one's not. Um, that was a, a clear uh, a story. Uh, we liked it, but you know that's not the case when you actually go dig deeper. Uh, so coming to the 2017, uh, another group from Italy, uh, again, they looked into more isolates uh, and taking the same area uh, of covering overlapping region of movement protein and crop protein, as you can you see there are three different clades, but in this uh, diagram, all those uh, black colored triangles uh, are representing the isolates uh, that are showing symptoms. So that means they're actually um, uh, separated into two, two groups, but not actually uh, sticking to the earlier uh, observation of you know, two different clades for symptomatic and asymptomatic. They can be different. So this um, further, um, another study in 2019 by Tortini et al, uh, what they did is uh, they taken um, another approach to see if uh, another part of the genome could be uh, could could give us some answers to differentiate between symptom symptomatic and asymptomatic strains, um, and what they did they, they took a large portion of genome uh, starting from 2,811 base pair to the end of three prime, and uh, what they observed based on 22 uh, isolates that they have sequenced uh, is that. Um, there, there are two clades, what they called gamma and beta clades, um, that they can clearly differentiate using this region uh, as, as, a, as a base for differentiating symptomatic and asymptomatic. But there is also another, um, uh, another clade, which is uh, obviously not ubiquitous in terms of uh, um, differentiating this, this phenomena. But at least the isolates uh, that they have sequenced from uh, uh, from France in, the, well, in this particular study, some of these isolates can be differentiated based on the symptoms. But whether that is holding true or not, but uh, what we have done further studies here in Canada, uh, it's, it's quite different, which I'll be sharing in, in, a, in a couple of minutes. So another study um, uh, by Haley et al, um, again, it's very interesting to see uh, when they have taken uh, a complete full genomes of 169 isolates and tried to see the evolutionary history of GPGV uh, based on some statistical methods um, in the phylogeny uh, and comparing, comparing that with uh, the evolution history. What they have observed, uh, what they inferred uh, from this study is um, um, by taking the grapevine uh, very inner necrosis virus as an outgroup here, um, that the GPGV might have uh, originally I, um, originated from China and eventually probably spread into European regions uh, and then further uh, into the new new world, uh, the, the North and South American uh, countries. So that's that's uh, an interesting part of this particular study. 
So um, further, um, what is happening in, in Canada in terms of, uh, uh, especially with the GBGV. Um, so we do have previous surveys that have been reported, um, the presence of GBGV uh, from all four provinces, um, uh, British Columbia, Ontario, and Nova Scotia. Um, but based on our observations so far, at least uh, I can speak uh, in terms of uh, British Columbia with the collaboration from Dr. Jose and Tom Lowry, and in Ontario from, from collaborations with Dr. Wendy McFadden Smith that uh, so far during our observations and testing so many uh, samples that we have found two individual wines that are showing symptoms uh, that are specifically located in two vineyards, but we've been monitoring those vineyards uh, say for the last uh, four to five years, uh, or uh, some, some, and probably in BC it's more than that. But interestingly, um, this uh, particular strain of symptomatic strain of GPGV in those wines are um, local. Local, it's not spreading so far. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, uh, we have not seen the GPGV somewhere else. But whatever we have seen or tested uh, positive for GPGV is mostly asymptomatic. Um, so that being said, um, I just wanted to show this um, um, slide uh, from this. Uh, this is a, a study that my master's students, Min Wu is doing, and he's planning to submit this uh, for a publication very soon. So what he did is he, um, he sequenced more than uh, 40 different isolates uh, from different provinces. Uh, we also gathered a few sequences from our collaborators. When we put together all that particular portion of CP, uh, MP overlapping region, generated the, uh, a, a cladogram, as you can see very clearly that um, uh, the blue shaded area, which we call is calling as clay two and the yellow shaded is a clay one, um, all our isolates from Canada and most of the isolates from the States as, uh, as well are grouping into the clay one, which uh, host most of the asymptomatic isolates. And then again, here the symptomatic isolates are represented in red color, uh, asymptomatic isolated or represented in, in black. So as you can see, um, most of the symptomatic isolates were uh, are from Europe, European isolates are grouped into cluster two. That is something very interesting that we have seen so far. We've been still uh, doing more, more and more uh, detailed studies on exploring different parts of the genome to see uh, if it can make any sense, uh, it can influence anything uh, on what we are observing in the field, especially in terms of the, the symptoms that it can produce. Um, with that, uh, I just wanted to uh, conclude um, uh, uh, with this slide before uh, acknowledging um, that I just wanted to reiterate what Ethan was saying before that um, um, you know, Gree virus is there. Uh, we are testing both in, in, in term verification program as well as the long-term certification uh, standard. And um, um, we do think that it is an important virus. Um, and with that, I acknowledge all the, the collaborators that we have. And uh, I really thank you uh, for CGCN, uh, RCCV for giving me this opportunity. And it is, and it is back to you, Ethan. Perfect, Sid. Thank you very much for the, uh, the thorough presentation. I certainly uh, learned a lot from that one. And uh, like you had been saying before, a bit of a, a new virus for everybody to contend with. So uh, lots of information to share. Uh, all right, Maher, I'll uh, allow you to pull your presentation up and uh, I'll introduce you here. Um, Dr. al Rouhani is, uh, is doing double duty for us today. He's gonna talk both about uh, Pinot Gris virus from a, an American perspective and also talk a bit about Syrah decline as well. So I thank him for, for offering to do both. Uh, so Dr. Maher al is the Director of Foundation Plant Services or FPS, which is a unit at the University of California, Davis, dedicated to the distribution of disease tested, true to identity planting stock. He has expertise in developing molecular diagnostic tools for the detection and identification of agents of virus diseases and has a highly productive research program. He pioneered the characterization of plant viruses and FPS crops, such as grapevines, roses, and fruit and nut trees through the application of high throughput sequencing, or HTS. His expertise and technical support are provided regarding the adoption of HTS technologies for applications in routine certification testing and the development of standards for HTS use in plant diagnostics. 
Since 2009, he has taken an active role in the National Clean Plant Network, an organization of experts and scientists from clean stock programs throughout the United States dedicated to ensuring the availability of clean plant material to industry stakeholders. Without further ado, I will turn it over. Thank you, Ethan. Uh, thanks for the invitation and for the introduction. So uh, I will be sharing a few uh, results with, uh, with the group today about, first we're talking about the CIRA decline, our, <clears throat> our main findings here, and also talking about the pin grease. Let's start with the, <clears throat> excuse me, about the CIRA decline. Okay, uh, I think give a little bit an introduction about Foundation Plant Services. Most of you are familiar with it, but just to re reinforce the best message here about our mission is to introduce plant material uh, from foreign countries. Also, we do diagnostic testing and we maintain a large collection of plant material that's can registered uh, through the certification. We work closely with the California Department of Agriculture as we basically the, the holder of the clean plant uh, uh, foundations. So with this foundation, which is the generation one, we have about, about almost a thousand cultivar, almost 2,100 selections. And basically for the CIRA, about 57 publicly available clones. With the CIRA decline, uh, just to give you an idea about the symptoms, this is, was discovered back in 1993 or reported in, in France, it started by expressing some symptoms in, in the trunk. Uh, you can see some symptoms there, deformating and the graft union, very poor uh, take, and you see the swelling, cracking, and there is basically a re report that it's not only the symptoms in the grafted, Sira plants, it's also observed in some uh, symptoms in the self-rooted Sira. With the canopy, I will say the reddening is the flagging here. But so you see yellowing during the early growing season, fall reddening, and you can basically, uh, there is no leaf rolling here when with the reddening. It's so reddening without tree flowing. <clears throat> We started by looking at, okay, what's causing this? What's, is this is an environmental? When you talk with Sira decline on different type of soil, you see that similar symptoms is showing the same thing. And this is basically similar Sira clones observed similar basically symptoms. We talked about when evaluating grafting techniques, hormone or waxing, uh, some rootstock like Richter 1 in 10, which, which is our 110 or, or 99, showed increase in sensitivity. You see more symptoms. As this is a water stress, heat stress, all these questions were open for discussion. Uh, a group in France, uh, in Pav and Ross, did some work in the Sierra and they found uh, this marker where it's most 80. 6% there's correlation, high correlation between the sensitivity of the clone and those, those, this model, the presence of this marker. And I will be talking about this more. So is it a genetic related issue? We will see. Pathogens. We did some work to look for viruses, also fungal, phytoplasma, bacteria, but this is different type of we detected some viruses, especially the grapevine Sierra virus one, when we would discover it, but there was no correlation. So you see it in both symptomatic and asymptomatic. Also, there is some cases where the virus elimination was conducted and there was no difference in, in the symptoms or uh, expressing the Sierra own symptoms. This was the first project I started working in, in this project in, back in 2004. And when we start using high throughput sequencing in 2007, we did some CIRA study. And the idea was to study, is this, there's just to roll out any pathogen. So that's the first study we published about the CIRA work. 
where we for finding that we discovered the grapevine serial virus one, we thought, oh, maybe this is correlated, but it turned out that there is no correlation between that virus and the symptoms, as I showed earlier, that it was detected from both. Here is the, those two vines, CIRA6 and CIRA8. The CIRA6 was grafted in a proper 5PB rootstock, and you can see the swollen and the, 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 the cracking in the trunk and the reddening in the leaves compared to a CIRA8, which is completely asymptomatic with a healthy looking leaves and trunk. The result showed that we got some virus infection in both, but there was no correlation. There is no 100% correlation between the finding of the virus and the symptoms. So as part of the pipeline here at Foundation Plant Services at FPS, we usually do micro shoot tip culture to do virus elimination. So we did this micro shoot tip culture, which is basically taking the, the part of the plant, excising it and put under the microscope as a very small, uh, basically part of those uh, meristem tissue or meristem dome. You take it and basically under the microscope, you excise, you put it in the media, you transfer and you climatize and you test to verify that you confirm the successful virus elimination. And if you are familiar with the protocol 2010, which is basically a list of 30 plus, 37 plus viruses or pathogens, we tested those plant material that we produced from virus elimination, and we found out that those basically daughter plant, you will see with anything with 0.1 means that it passed through the tissue culture. And we tested those plant using this protocol of uh, the 2010 protocol and all came negative. So we were able to eliminate those viruses that we found in the mother of CIRA6 vines. And we planted them in the field, two vines in 2011 and 16 vines in 2014. And we wait or hopefully that basically we'll be able to eliminate the symptoms of the CIRA. But unfortunately, that was not the case. Here, side by side, the mother plant versus the daughter plant, which is passed through virus elimination and tested with no symptoms. And you can see the plants that we tested in 2014 and 2011 start to start showing some symptoms. This gave us an indication that there is, again, confirming our previous findings that there is no correlation whatsoever between the presence of the virus, at least in this case, and symptom expression. Again, more symptoms you see in different clones. Here you can see CIRA4, the mother in the classic foundation, and you can see the CIRA4.1, which passed through tissue culture. CIRA7 is the same. You see symptoms in uh, both. So to confirm our findings, just to see what if we are missing anything, we did also, we did some high throughput sequencing confirmation in those tissue culture generated plants. Again, we didn't detect any virus or pathogen in those CIRA 6.61, which is basically passed through, HD, uh, through HTS and uh, tissue culture. So there is no, again, there is no evidence that there is a causal agent of a viral pathogen. So we took the same route that shared by the, our colleague in France, and we want to look for this VMC 5G7 SS marker and see how this is basically, we did, this is just a brief, you know, introduction of the technique, but the finding was all the symptomatic finds have the, with the genotype that we see with the leaf burdening with the CIRA declining, there was a hundred, almost 100% correlation with the presence of this marker. So we thought, oh, maybe that's the, the issue here. In fact, this, uh, this table summarized the result, and you can see whatever highlighted it's between 4 and 4.1. And again, just to remind you that the selection includes the decimal, the point one basically went and underwent for the tissue culture. So we did virus elimination. We verified that there is no virus there, but 
almost in all cases, we were able to detect uh, um, this marker for sensitivity. So to conclude this work, we find that there is no evidence to suggest any causal agent of a viral for this basically CRI decline in, in our uh, foundation. Uh, it, there is a high correlation between the selection and the sensitivity of the clone and the presence of this uh, marker. And we later basically, there is a different genotype of the decline that we can say that we can select some different clones or varieties of the CIRA. Uh, and we say, okay, if you test for that marker, most probably that this is uh, gonna be basically infected. And here, some of those markers that we mentioned are different, the, the, the type of the, of the CIRA 0.6 versus the CIRA, and where you always find the marker. So our finding to summarize that we can, we are, are now advising the growers before you plant, check for this marker because it gives you an idea because there is a correlation, a uh, high correlation between the presence of this marker and the symptoms. Switching gears now to uh, the Pinot Gris virus. And uh, I think Sud, Sud made my, my, uh, my day much easier with, by providing all the background information. So I will go this over this uh, quickly. But after the discovery of this virus, we want to know and advancing our knowledge in California about this virus because we found this virus in our foundation back in 2016, and we found it in completely asymptomatic virus. The Perigo National was the first find where we detected Pinot Gris virus in our foundation. Also, a private lab did some work in some uh, vineyards in Napa, and they basically detected this virus in different varieties and different selections. So we said, okay, we need to work because we know based on this information about this virus, as you mentioned, this is transmitted by mites, the aerifid mites here, and this is widely distributed in California. So as it has been reported with both asymptomatic and symptomatic vines based on the previous studies, and we confirmed this also in, in California. So what we did in 2016, we, want, we got some funding from the American Vineyard Foundation, and we want to molecular characterize, did the molecular characterization for, uh, for the grapevine Pinot Gris virus, and our main goal is to improve our detection methods. Just quick, uh, Overview of the objective of that study. It's basically a survey and look what's the correlation between the symptoms asymptomatic, virus strains if possible, and we want to improve our detection methods. During the 2016 and 17, we visited different growing, uh, you know, grape growing regions around California. And as we noticed that this virus is mostly detected in the Napa County. This has changed now. We get it detected from different, basically, counties uh, after we finished the study. But the first couple of years, that was widely distributed in Napa and not other counties or regions. Uh, in basically, and the table shows the number of samples detected for each region. We noticed something important here, and that's emphasizing the importance of using a clean plant material. In this block, which is one year old vineyard, 100% infection of grape plant vinegaries, and that was a tap sub on 1616C. And when you see this, this gives you a clear indication that this material started infected. And that's again, another reason that we want to make sure that this is uh, well, well, well consider when we exchange plant material or when we get uh, buying a new plant material to establish new vineyards. The name grapevine Pinot Gris, it's the way that we name the viruses, basically in, an old way to name the viruses because it was first reported in Pinot Gris, but as you can see clearly here, it infects and affects basically different 
varieties and selections. What about the detection methods? Mainly time of sampling, because in North Italy, where the virus was first reported, they noticed that the virus titer will basically decrease during the late seasons. And we like to use leaf petioles here at FPS to detect basically the plant viruses. So we did a similar study using basically the real-time PCR, which is a little bit more sensitive than the conventional, but we found that the same result that this virus also, the virus titer or the detectability of this virus, the sensitivity reduces for the time uh, later in the season. We went ahead and did some molecular characterization for some of the California isolates using high throughput sequencing. And we found that all the plants that were showing symptoms were basically mixed infected with grapevine fan leaf. So from all the plants that I showed you, we detected in Napa, majority of the, the samples were asymptomatic. But when we see symptoms similar to this one, you see that this is a mixed infection with fan leaf and other viruses. There was no big difference between, you know, that's uh, the sequences that we've detected here, and it's kind of 95 to 99% homology, homology with the asymptomatic references in the gene pack. But this is, we will talk about this is more. In 2018, we identified one case where we did HTS and it was asymptomatic, showing symptoms, but it was basically from uh, California Department of Agriculture during their, their survey of the, the fields, they found those symptoms. We got the sample, we did HDS on that sample, and basically we see that this sample was showing symptoms and there was no fan leaf. So it showed this, that's the early studies distinguishing between symptomatic and asymptomatic variant. Again, this is just continue to work with the sequence or for basically the, sequ the samples. It's you cannot distinguish virus variants or strain based on symptomatology. And this is just we added the isolate that we sequenced here in California. And you can see that there is several outliers from that study just to show if you will say that this is basically between there is no clear evidence or clear cut between symptomatic and asymptomatic uh, isolates. In fact, if you look at the one outlier is basically here, which if you look at the asymptomatic, you see that the Negro Amaro isolate is located in plate A, and this is again another confirmation that you cannot distinguish between the isolate based on the sequence. Because the idea was at the beginning to try to develop an assay, PCR assay, real time PCR assay, to distinguish between those as virus basically as strains of symptomatic or asymptomatic, but this is didn't work. Again, so we talked about this. There has been basically many outliers of uh, distinguishing, not distinguishing between the sequence, asymptomatic or asymptomatic. With this is recent study where they did an infectious clone where they can basically generate the virus in the lab or the full genome of the virus in the lab. And they did some st study between symptomatic strain and asymptomatic strain. They showed symptoms in both herbaceous host and in the grave, but they found out that after a time, the sample will recover. So the symptomatic sample will become asymptomatic with time. One of the first hypotheses due for the expression of the symptoms was maybe because of the virus titer is low, you can say that maybe if when you see low titer, you will see symptoms, you will not see symptoms. And you will, and, and, and basically with high titer, you will see very symptoms. Again, that was not confirmed and not supported. 
because both symptomatic and asymptomatic samples show similar uh, CTQ value, which is basically a way to measure or reflect the virus titer in a plant. We continue to do more research because now we want to do more a kind of epidemiological study and see where what's the source of this virus and how, how what's the spread in California. So we did some surveys, further surveys in California, and we did some studies from the germ plasma collection here in, in, in California, and we detected some plants. And the idea was we want to see just to confirm again to get more 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 work to get more uh, isolate to be able to develop a more sensitive assays and again a more recent study in 2019 confirmed the findings if there is no basically uh, distinguish you cannot distinguish the sample the, the the sample from symptomatic asymptomatic based on the sequence a few private lab approach us and basically we try to develop an in-house assay, ELISA assay for the Pinot Gris virus. We did, it didn't work. So we tried to use this commercial kit from Bioreba and because they offer uh, the virus kit testing for, for basically this ELISA test for, uh, for the Pinot Gris virus. And this is what they want basically, they, recommend mature leaves. Uh, basically, we want to find out that this is basically was not an adequate for this test. Let's, I'll show you with, when you do side by side, we found that the ELISA kit misses basically several samples. Another point that we would like to know, we know that this virus infects some herbaceous hosts. And from other viruses, I'm taking here the grapevine red blood virus. We know that the grapevine red blood virus also infects free living vines or wild grapes. So we decided to do the same study. So we tested 23 free living vines and we tested them for, red, for Pinot Gris virus. And as you can see, we were able to detect the Pinot Gris virus and the Free living vines or the wild grapes are surrounding the vineyards, the commercial vineyards in Napa. Here, some overview of those locations where we basically uh, sampled. And this is how a few examples of the, the wild vetus or free living plants, uh, the vines that we basically sampled for this virus. One of the points that also we got a question is, is it possible like with the late in the season, you get false negative? So we did a comparison between the testing the canes, arc scraping versus the petioles. And basically we found out that it's yes, testing the canes are much basically, and the mature young leaves in California can be uh, showing some false negative in late late in the season. So we would like always to test in the right time uh, for this virus. Which is basically, we, as I mentioned earlier, we'd like to see what's the distribution. And we tested both the vines during the winters and during the, 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 uh, during the growing season. And we found there is a discrepancy between PCR and ELISA and several basically uh, Pinot Gris sample were not detected by ELISA, as I mentioned earlier. So this work was published about the wild or wild grapes or the free living grapes, and also the study about the virus diversity in California and the spread. So these are the two papers already published and I'm happy to answer any question. Thank you. Perfect, Smar. Thank you so much for your uh, your double presentations. I appreciate that. A lot of a uh, lot of work for you, rather last minute. But thanks for uh, for doing that. Um, I'll remind our attendees here. If anybody has any questions, you can type them into the the Q and A box there, and uh, we'll be happy to address those. Um, I've got a couple just because we don't have any in the the queue right now. So 
Um, I have one for for both of you, and maybe you can speak to um, you know the Canadian perspective versus the American perspective for uh, for Pinot Gris virus. Um, but so both of you mentioned that in a lot of cases, um, positive samples are asymptomatic, um, and so I'm I'm curious as to why the virus is of of such concern. I mean, as I speaking from our Canadian perspective, you know, for our verification program with CGCN, this is one of the four main viruses that we're testing for. Um, so my question is, if if many of the positives aren't showing symptoms, and and perhaps there's um, you know, not not a clear or imminent threat. Uh, why is it of such serious concern? Go ahead, so if you want to start, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so one of the reasons that we, uh, <clears throat> I think we should include uh, uh, GPGV when the program has initiated uh, the CGCN uh, verification program back in uh, 2018, if, I, if I'm guessing right. Um, so that time, still, we didn't have um, much information about this virus, how it is behaving. You know, most of our studies that we have shown so far uh, try to understand, you know, what, what is the reasons behind. Still, we don't know the complete answers. Um, still, a lot of studies are coming up, uh, and especially working with uh, grapevine viruses from the last few years, uh, uh, I'm sure Meher will, Meher will agree with me that it takes time. Uh, it takes time to understand the epidemiology um, the concepts behind uh, uh, the symptom expression, uh, whether uh, uh, we, we still don't know whether these uh, asymptomatic st strains will turn into symptomatic strains at some point, um, uh, depending on what conditions, depending on what, what factors that influence them. Um, so that's the, probably the reason that um, based on the, um, the information that we had, that the mites which are present everywhere uh, could be a potential vector uh, based on that information as well as the, the severity index of the symptomatic strain. Um, we, I, I think we have rated uh, Pinot Gris uh, should be there in the verification program. Um, of course, it is there in the long-term certification program um, from both um, NCPN as well as here from CGCN. But those are the, the factors that we consider when we were including this virus. But more and more that we have, we've been studying, we came to know that the asymptomatic strains are present in a large proportions when you compare to the symptomatic strains. Uh, whether that could be that that will be standing true for next few years, I don't know. So, <laughs> so right. Meher, you want to add anything? Yeah, basically, uh, I I totally agree. And what we did, you know, in in the Cali in the American or the California model, we added. Uh, Pinot Gris to our testing, even if it's not regulated or not one of the regulated viruses. But we took this as a voluntary step and we added it, this to our testing since 2016. But what we are trying to do here is to flush it out of the system by eliminating, you know, pro 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 providing the industry with material that's free of this virus and other viruses while they can basically replace the material that it's they are working on in, in uh, with uh, uh, with their um, uh, with the with the nurseries so instead of going to the nurseries and say okay this virus has to be regulated asap we are taking the approach that we are flushing it out of the system and make sure that <clears throat> as suit did said just now, we don't know if this virus can be with a mixed infection can be causing some, some serious, uh, serious symptoms. If this virus uh, uh, can be basically uh, turning to, to an, an issue. The two good things here, the two positive things that yes, it's asymptomatic. These RFID mites are very easily controlled by adding sulfur to the vineyard. So this is, you, this is not, we are not talking about red blotch. We are not talking about leaf rolls that uh, the vectors are more aggressive. The area of mites are easily controlled. And we need to keep in mind that this is a serious problem in Europe. France, this is a serious problem for Europe and maybe it, it, some part in Italy, some part in France, this is a serious problem. So it's a kind of, as the red blotch is a problem for us here in the Europe, at least for the US, I can speak about Canada, but for us, it's a major problem now we don't. We want to avoid any future damage for any virus. So it's 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 kind of a step in the right direction, I believe. 
without panicking. It's important not to panic. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you both for your uh, your insight. That's very helpful. Um, I have one more question uh, for Maher about the uh, the Sara decline now. Um, so you talked about selections that don't have the particular genetic marker, um, you know, being less sensitive or perhaps less susceptible um, to the to the decline. Um, do is there still a risk though for for those selections? Say if if it doesn't have this genetic marker, is there still a chance, <laughs> albeit a little lower, that the the vines will be symptomatic at some point? So basically so far, the one with the marker are showing symptoms. Right. The one with the markers are showing symptoms. The one without the markers are so far with, we are in looking and indiv uh, visually looking at those vines and there's no symptoms uh, on, on developed even with, with time. And I'm talking about basically almost 11 years mm -hmm. and we got some plants that's older in the fields and we tested them they are not showing any symptoms. So if I understood the question, is this is gonna change with the, with the time? It's so far with, again, studying viruses in perennial crops can take a long time. And that's, so far we are not finding evidence that the virus will, that the symptoms will, will appear after the time if the markers are absent. Right, okay. So if, Forgive me if, if my understanding of genetics is a little off, but if you know, no, for that's example, fine. you're if you're taking and you're propagating from those vines that do not have this genetic marker, would you eventually be able to eliminate this problem essentially? If you're, I think you're that's propagating? that's what that's that's what we are recommending as as basically a recommendation when uh, some when a nursery approach us and say okay, uh, and that's why we did this work to start with. We want to make sure that we are trying to provide some some information to be selective with the clones. And uh, we talk, we work in, in finding alternative, because if you want to plant Syrah, that's fine. But instead of planting Syrah six, let's go with four, or let's go with uh, with eight or, uh, or 99, the one that they are less sensitive. So we are giving you an alternative so you can take make a basically uh, uh, an, uh, an, an an advanced uh, guess of you will sh this the Sarah will express symptoms in the future or no. Right. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, just one more question right now, also about the the Syrah. Uh, would it be possible to silence or eliminate the marker using CRISPR to confirm that it is the link? to the decline, and if so, to produce decline-free Syrah? Excellent, excellent, excellent question. And that's, yes, I know some, I, I'm, some group are trying to do that, but again, um, it's it takes time. But that's, yeah, that's, uh, I know the French group is trying to do something similar. Perfect. That's good yeah. suggestion. Hmm. Thank you. No, I mean, I, I get the sense from uh, from both of our topics here today that this, it is a, a relatively young field of research uh, for, for both concerns here. So it's uh, clearly more is needed. Uh, one more question pops up here actually, um, and it's about uh, GPGV. So either or both of you are, are welcome to answer. Uh, do people observe GPGV asymptomatic to symptomatic transition during the growing season or does it happen during dormancy? Oh. I think uh, if, if you say, uh, if I may, um, asymptomatic to symptomatic trans transition, uh, I think the, what we people have observed from symptomatic to asymptomatic during the season, um, but a few studies have reported asymptomatic to symptomatic um, during the growing season, obviously not in the dormant season, uh, but uh, so far, we haven't seen that here in uh, Canadian vineyards so far. Uh, I'm, I'm sure, I'm not sure about the uh, experience in uh, California, Maher. Um, All except one case of the sam samples we sim tested symptomatic were showing uh, a mixed infection of fan leaf. So none of the asymptomatic cases except the Negro Amaro case was showing symptoms. And the grower or the customer who provided this Negro Amaro was 
he reported that he, they saw this, the, 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 these symptoms basically, they can't see them uh, every year. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, one final question that's popped up again here or comment slash question. Uh, an Italian team had identified three clades of GPGV, two being asymptomatic, one symptomatic, and one of the asymptomatic clades suspected of having the potential to become symptomatic. Has this been confirmed by any other research? No. No. Yeah. Uh, a lot of outliers, and the more you sequence, the more you basically you will find them everywhere. No. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, especially when we are using the high throughput sequencing, we are <clears throat> more and more asymptomatic uh, strains of GPGV uh, than than ever before. So, perfect. All right, probably the uh, the easiest question of uh, of all of them to answer. Uh, all right. Well, I'll just take a, a brief moment to wrap up here. Oops, that was okay. There we go. Uh, just quickly wrap up here. Thank you uh, to our attendees for for submitting your questions. Uh, but first and foremost, special thanks to our uh, two guest speakers here today, uh, Dr. Pajari and Dr. Al Rani. We really appreciate both of you uh, taking the time to be here and, uh, and share with us a lot of information about something that's uh, quite new for our industry, especially uh, here in Canada. So thank you for uh, enlightening us a little bit here. Uh, for our attendees, obviously want to let you know that we still have two more webinars coming up in uh, 2022. We have uh, the last two are actually both cluster research updates from the Grape and Wine Research Cluster. We have crop protection and monitoring coming up in a couple of weeks on June 9th. Uh, and then the last one is focused on optimizing the quality of Canadian wines, which takes place on June 23rd. Um, so if you follow CGC and RCCV on Facebook and Twitter uh, or subscribe to our email newsletter, You'll be able to get updates uh, about those webinars in advance when the uh, the registration links become available. Also, I mentioned off the top that this webinar session today has been recorded uh, and it'll be posted to our websites and to our social media platforms and on YouTube uh, within the next day or so. So if anybody here wants to revisit the webinar or copy the link and send it to somebody who wasn't able to attend today, that'll be available to you uh, in the near future. Uh, last but not least, we do have a, a short survey that should pop up when you go to exit the webinar here. Uh, we'd appreciate it if you could fill that out just to uh, give us a bit of feedback on what you thought of the session today and see how we can improve for our future webinars. Uh, so once again, I just want to thank all the attendees for being here today. Uh, thank you, Sud. Thank you, Maher, for, uh, for being you. here. And taking you for your time. And we uh, hope to see everybody at our next webinars in June. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest thank of your you. day, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.